Hi, so my name is Kimberly and I'm from UC Davis Cosmos Cluster 4 Computer Security. So my project was on implantable medical devices, which is why it's called Heart of Security. Um, and these alleviate a ver variety of physiological ailments, including diabetes, Parkinson's, and arrhythmia. The number of IMDs in the U.S. is expected to rise, as you can see from the statistics on the board. Um, one reason for this is because it's just more convenient to have something inside of you that would help your um, disease, like it would treat your disease rather than having, for example, if you have diabetes, having to shoot yourself with <laughs> an injection every day or every hour. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is an insulin pump. Um, an insulin pump is, and glucose monitoring system is one of the most widely used therapies to treat diabetes. Um, in essence, it pretty much gets a glucose monitor, which tracks the amount of glucose in your blood, and it sends the readings to the actual insulin pump, which will, with other components, will control the amount of insulin that is injected into your system. Um, so in 2011, a study was released revealing um, that these could be hacked. Um, the people who did the study were named Lee and uh, I, I'll just say Lee because the other two names are long. They used something called a universal software radio peripheral, which is a radio device used to eavesdrop on commun uh, like communications, especially wireless ones. And they found that they could intercept the radio communications between the remote control and the insulin pump. So they also figured out that when they eavesdropped on the communication, it, most of the data was transmitted in plain text. Um, the things that were transmitted included um, things like the device type, um, which buttons were pressed, whatever readings were transmitted, and more importantly, the device pin. With the device pin, you can pretty much control the entire system, and you can make it so that it um, sends information to the insulin pump. You can stop or start injections, and you can yeah, send incorrect glucose readings to the insulin pump. And the effects of this would, are pretty serious. Um, they can cause either hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia. It's pre pretty much either too much or too little glucose in the blood, which can, can be fatal. Um, they also were able to use a USRP as the remote control. And so they, using the USRP for, as a remote control, they found that they could, as far as like 20 meters away, they could actually control um, the insulin injection, and they could also, and the insulin pump would actually accept the USRP as the remote control. Um, they also were able to perform replay attacks because the defense mechanism against replay attacks in a normal insulin system is that they use a counter, but they found that it was the counter would accept is any packet as long as the counter was different from the last one. So they could capture two packets and just alternate them, and since they were different from each other, the insulin pump would accept that packet. Um, so the Lee study suggests two possible offenses. One is cryptography. Um, they suggest a rolling code cryptography in which the encoder is embedded in the remote control and the decoder is in the insulin pump, and the encryption key is shared. It become, with a rolling code, it's difficult for adversaries to extract the device pin or launch replay attacks, but the degree of security does rel uh, depend on the encryption algorithm. And while it can help solve integrity and confidentiality attacks, it would most likely not be an obvious solution for availability attacks. Integrity attacks is pretty much where you just want to know for sure that that is the correct glucose reading. Um, confidentiality is you, um, a patient I mean, it should not be obvious to other people that there is an insulin pump on another person. And availability attacks is, um, you just want to make sure the data gets there on time um, and in an efficient manner. Um, another solution is body coupled communication, which is BCC. Uh, it uses the human body as a transmission medium to enable wireless communication. The advantages of this is that it's the communication range with uh, um, an insulin pump using BCC is limited to the human body, so that any communication that goes on has to be near the human body, and so that would reduce the risk of any interference. Um, and they, the Lee study actually does modify an insulin pump using BCC, and they found that 
it does significantly make it more secure and the noise level and signal strength does change. Um, another impl implantable medical device is, that has shown vulnerabilities is an implantable cardiac defibrillator, which is a device that monitors and responds to heart pacing using the nodes placed on the patient's heart. Um, it regularly sends a small shock to, the, shock to the heart to pace the heart, and when needed, it will defibrillate the heart with a larger shock. Um, after surgery, the healthcare practitioner uses an external device to program the ICD to perform diagnostics, read and write private data, and adjust therapy settings. Um, as you can see, that's already a really big problem, using an external device to program it. Um, for example, any hardware malfunctions would cause the person to be in serious trouble, and any software malfunctions would command, cause command shocks, and where a shock is unnecessarily sent to the heart, which is also bad. ICDs also transmit data such as EKG readings um, using a magnetic field and magnet and the magnetic field comes from the magnet in the programming head which is part of the programmer that's placed to the, close to the patient's ICD. Um, the ICD also uses wireless communication on both short range and the long range and with the and they found that of course a larger range is more convenient and more flexible, but it is also easier to capture transmissions, which is what this study did. Um, they captured the bits and they analyzed them, and they were able to use, again, the USRP to eavesdrop, and they also attacked using a replay attack, and they were also able to get the ICD's presence, model serial number, they also disclosed patient and cardiac data, used an interrogation command to divulge personal information such as patient name, diagnostic, diagnosis, EKG readings, and they also changed the therapies, induced fibrillation, forced denial of service, and they also mentioned other attacks such as buffer overflows or insecure software updates. Um, so this study suggests what is called zero power defenses, named such because they they want as little power as necessary to defend the system. Um, so one of them is zero power notification, which audibly alerts the patient to any security sensitive events. Another is zero power authentication, which authenticates re okay, requests from an external device programmer. And zero power sensible key exchange, which combines zero power notification and authentication to alert the patient of any security threats. Um, so there's many other um, IMDs besides insulin pumps and ICDs, but there haven't really been any other studies show, showing the vulnerabilities of them. And so there are many studies that suggest what should be um, emphasized in future models of, I, of IMDs. So in conclusion, the vulnerabilities do represent both a threat and opportunity. While no large-scale threats have been mounted against the users, um, the studies show that the possibility exists, and that itself is uh, pretty scary. Um, there's, um, so what this calls for is that biomedical engineers and computer scientists must collaborate in order to produce a more secure and trustworthy market of implantable medical devices. And I would suggest research into another IMD, which is a neurostimulator, which is put into the brain of a um, someone who has Parkinson's disease, which controls their symptoms. Thank you. So, two questions. One is, do you think this could reduce the cost of health care in the country? Because then, 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 then you'll be a real hero. <laughs> But the, the second question would be, uh, so the availability questions, so I mean, ca causing you know, the, the device to be essentially unavailable to the, to the technician who wants to control it, could be a serious problem. Any ideas what you can, what can be done about this? Um, I wouldn't, I or, you would don't think, or maybe you don't think it's a serious problem, that's okay too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would say that using kind of a more regulated control of like the data that's being sent in and out, as in like having kind of two layers of defense, one to control like what's just random data that's being sent, okay. and then yeah. the other one would actually determine whether it's legitimate or not. Yeah. Okay. All right.